And that's it's the law of the first first appearance, it's called. What is it called? The law of the first appearance. And the first time that a word appears in the Bible, they say, you know, look at that word and find out what it means in that context. And it should mean that all the way through. It's like setting a precedent for the rest of the, of the time. And that's, you know, if you have a lot of dreams, the first place you need to go is right here. Yeah. Because God's language is right here. And you should be able to find all the elements of your dreams <coughs> right here. Dreams are arrows to the target. This is the target. So you take the pieces, the elements of your dreams, you look them up in the scriptures, and as you're looking in the scriptures, God will reveal the truth of what he was trying to tell you in your dream. Don't go to the dream books. Don't go to the Barnes and Noble and get their new age dream books. No. This is the book. It's in here. Okay, let's look at the Genesis scripture. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested. And on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done, then God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it. In other words, he set it apart for himself as being holy. That, that's God's day. Because on it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Now, God was not tired. That's not why he does it. God does not get tired. <laughs> He's not like us. He doesn't need to go and take a nap, you know. He rested because he was fulfilled. He had completed, you know, he had had this incredible dream forever, how many eons we don't know, you know, and he finally has it in living color right before him, and it's <coughs> all working, and everybody's happy, and it's, he was so happy that he just wanted to sit back for 24 hours and just enjoy it. That's what Sabbath is supposed to be. That's what our lives are supposed to be. Now, I want us to look at the Hebrew and see what it means. This is what the, it looks like in Hebrew. When you read it from right to left, And in Hebrew, every letter has a number value, every number, every letter has a picture, and every letter has a meaning. And so when you go to your Strong's and you find the number, if it's in the Old Testament, it will have right beside it, the number will have the Hebrew letters for that word. And I will send you the charts that I have at home that show what each word means and what each value means, and it will help you in your studies. And that's what I did with rest. I had never done it with this word before. <coughs> and first of all, you know, when you just look at the meaning again, we're going to the same deal again where you're just looking at the meaning. It says to repose, to desist from exertion, to make to cease, to celebrate, to keep Sabbath, to put away, to put down, to make to rest, to be still, or to take away. However, when you go to the letters, that first letter over here that looks like a pitchfork or something is a mm -hmm. shin. It's called a shin. And it has a number value of 300, which we know not necessarily mean anything in this context, but it, and the number means victory over good, of good over evil, or Holy Spirit. The meaning of Shin is teeth, fire, the fire of God, to consume all of his enemies, to devour, to destroy, or something sharp. Okay, that next letter is a bet. This one in the middle is a bet. <coughs> and its number value is two, and it means, the two means to divide or division. And the meaning of the word bet is house or family. 
and it's the dwelling of God, or God's word, or his dwelling place. Okay, the last letter there is Tav, and that's the last letter of the alphabet in the Greek, in the Hebrew. It goes from Aleph to Tav, just like Greek goes Aleph to Tav, Alpha to Bet, you know. Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega, yes. And Jesus, I'm, I'm sure, never said Alpha and Omega because he did not speak Greek, and, but that's the way that it's in the, the Bible because that's the ones who were, they were translating it, and they did it all in Greek. And so I'm sure he said Alpha to Tav because mm -hmm. that's what he's from. And Tav means it has a value of 400. It means the outcome <coughs> of a trial or testing. And it means a cross, a covenant, a seal, a mark, a sign of ownership, to be finished or to complete. So when you put all of that together, the word Sabbath or rest means the zeal or the passion of God to divide us from our enemies and bring us into his house as a family and mark us as his own in covenant. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Yes. I don't know. I, I can't quite. I'm sorry. That's just yeah. massive. That is such a Can you say it again? Gift. Yeah, I'll say it again. The zeal or the passion of God to divide us from our enemies, <coughs> our enemies being all of our works mentality that we live in 24-7 and here in good old America, divide us from all of our enemies and bring us into his house as a family and mark us as his own in covenant. Mm -hmm. Now see, the Jewish people have been marked as his covenant people since day one, because they have practiced Sabbath. Yep. They've practiced it very legalistically, but they've also practiced it from their lives, <coughs> because they wanted to honor the God who has done so much for them. No, they don't know him like we know him, but they know him in a whole different way that we're about to get to know him. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. yeah. Yeah. So, this never-ending Sabbath that we're supposed to enjoy is this kind of Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And it's not the kind that you hear about in church much. No. <laughs> in fact, that's not what you're living at church at all, most of the time. <coughs> So rest is what marks us as his own. I don't know if you know anything about a Jewish wedding or not. Anybody? Uh, the groom picks out his bride, and then he has to decide first on a bride price with the father of the bride. They decide how much the groom is going to pay for the bride. You know, how many cows am I going to give so this slave can be my wife? Or, you know, what kind of houses or investments do I have to give to the father to help him so that he will let go of his daughter to let her be my wife? Well, Jesus paid the ultimate price mm -hmm. with his own blood. And he selected his bride of Israel, first of all, and then all of mankind when he went to the cross. He paid the price. Okay, then they go through, a, you know, a, a trial period of, of you know, the, the groom, first of all, goes to the bride at that point. She, he's paid the bride price with the father. He goes to the girl that he wants to marry. He takes a cup. He takes a cup, and he says, this is all that I am and all that I have and I'm giving it to you if you will be my bride. Mm -hmm. And she has the opportunity to say yes or no at that point. If she says yes, then she takes the cup, and then she hands it back to him. She said, this is all that I have and all that I am, and I accept your offer, and I will be your bride. That's what we're doing every time we take communion. We're renewing this covenant with him. Mm -hmm. It's not just a forgiveness of our sins. It's a recovenanting with our bridegroom. 
all that we have and all that we are to him and receiving all that he is and all that he has for us. Not trying to do it on our own, but doing it in his strength. Okay, we've done that. Everybody's happy, Yahoo, Mom, I'm going to be here, woo -hoo. And so then they spend the next two or three months getting ready for this wonderful uh, experience. And they have, they have the, the wedding. You know, and this is in the old days. They don't do it like this anymore, but in the old days they did. They would get married. And the ring that he put on, their fin on her finger was like what God did with the Sabbath. He marked her as being married. But they would not consummate the marriage until the groom went and built a house for them to live in. Mm -hmm. I go to prepare a place for you. And you cannot go with me now, but I will come back and get you. Wow. Wow. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So the groom would go, and he would add a, a room onto the father's house. Then they're still doing that in Israel today. They go and they build a room, or a, like a little apartment, onto the main house. Huh. And all the family lives together in this great big house, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, or higher and higher. You know, they'll, they'll <coughs> add another whole floor onto the house for the next kid with the family. And when the father says, okay, son, it looks, you know, the plumbing is cleared, the electricity's been here, you know, you're not gonna burn the house down, you can go get your bride. And Jesus said, you know, I don't know the day or the hour, only my father knows. Because only the father can give the okay for the son to go and get the bride. So then he goes to get the bride. And what do they hear first? The trumpets, announcing that the bridegroom is coming. Well, the Feast of Trumpets is what that's all about. And when Jesus comes again, it will likely be during the Feast of Trumpets. Yep. You know, he went to the cross on Passover. He went into the grave on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He arose on the Feast of First Fruits. The Holy Spirit was given to the church, and the church was birthed on the Feast of Weeks. And the other three feasts haven't been fulfilled yet. But Jesus fulfilled the first four, and I bet you anything he's going to fulfill the other three, which is the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and Feast of Tabernacles. He'll come back for his bride on the Feast of Trumpets. On Yom Kippur, Israel will recognize the one that they have pierced because Jesus will be coming back with the bride and all the armies of heaven to do work there, and they will recognize him as their Messiah. He caught up in the air with the rest of us, and then we will celebrate the tabernacle with him forever. Tabernacle. The wedding feast and the tabernacle. So all the feasts will be fulfilled in Christ. It's the story of redemption. The feasts are the story of redemption. It's the the plan of God's creation to bring his family together are all written in the feast. And yet the church, way back when, 300 AD, threw them all out with the dishwater and said, no way. That's a Jewish thing and we will not have anything to do with it. Well, thank God he's bringing it back. Amen. He's bringing it back. Because it's time for them. It's time for their fulfillment. We need to understand them. Okay, all that all that's free me, and we're not charging for that <laughs> <laughs> So what does it mean to be in covenant? Do you guys know? That's another word. We just throw it around like uh, you know, we're covenant kids. Okay. Let's make covenant. Let's have, let's have a marriage covenant. All right. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it meant. A long time ago, the swimming's like this in a lot of other countries where they make covenant all the time.